Anyway, good morning, everyone. On behalf of the Rail Enthusiast Society, allow me to welcome you to the 35th talk, monthly talk that we have been able to organize. In fact, we have to thank COVID that we started these monthly talks, and now they become as much of a regular feature of the Rail Enthusiast Society as any of our other activities. Today, as our speaker, we have Atulia Sinha, who describes himself as a railway member by profession, but a rail fan by choice. I have known him since 1987, when he was a trainee at Jamalpur, and I was one of the professors. But today, I don't consider him a student or a junior colleague. He's a friend and a fellow member of the Rail Enthusiast Society. In fact, I would say one of the more active members of the Rail Enthusiast Society. This is his fifth talk that he's presenting on in our uh, series. And uh, I don't think he needs any introduction. Uh, he is currently the principal chief mechanical engineer at the Chitranjan Locomotive Works. And uh, sh shortly before this, he was the additional general manager of the Southeastern Railway Zone. He, among working railwaymen, he is one of the few who is a rail enthusiast. It is a pity and unfortunate that very few railwaymen are rail enthusiasts. For them, the railway is a job, not a hobby. Anyway, I won't stay between you and Atulia Sena. It's over to you, Atulia. Thank you, sir. Good morning, everyone. It is a great uh, pleasure and privilege for me to be uh, speaking in this forum for the fifth time. And thank you very much for all the encouragement. I am very happy to see the gathering here, a lot of familiar faces. Good morning again to everyone. Uh, Apurva, I request you to uh, share the presentation. Yes, sir. So uh, the topic of today's presentation, the title is Once Upon a Track. And it's a series. This is the second in the series. And hopefully there'll be a third and a fourth also. So today the focus is on modern railway fiction. Now, what is railway fiction and what is modern railway fiction? We'll come to that in a moment. Next, please. Okay. So uh, let us start with a quote. And this is from an author called Daud Ali McCullum. He has written a very interesting uh, novel, which is about, uh, he has imagined three Indians who went to Britain and worked in a railway workshop during the Second World War. Uh, and this is a very interesting quote from that book. He says, the railway was the mid 19th century equivalent of the internet. So today, the way internet has changed the world, a new technology, which has brought in such sweeping changes, economic changes, technical changes, and so on. Uh, we'll, we'll go back, please. Yeah, sorry. So such sweeping changes and, uh, uh, this is what the railway did to the world in the mid 19th century. So that was the impact of railway. It was not just a technical uh, development. It had economic and social outcomes also. And part of that was that uh, the reading habit developed and new forms of literature, railway fiction also developed uh, along with the railways. Next, please. So let me explain my concept of railway fiction. It can be a short story, which is primarily set in a train or a station. It can be a novel where the railway forms a part of the plot, like around the world in 80 days, or there are significant scenes set in trains. For example, the namesake by Jhumpa Lahiri. Now in all railway fiction, in my opinion, the recurrent theme is meeting strangers because a railway carriage or a railway station, a railway platform is a place where people from different backgrounds get a chance to meet and interact. And from this interaction arises the opportunity and the pleasure of rail travel as well as rail fiction. Next, please. Apurva, next, please. So how do we classify railway fiction? You can have a classification based on format. Written word can be novel, short story, plays, poems, graphics, etc. Basically, I'll be concentrating on uh, novel and short story, the first two. The classification can be based on date of publication, 
which is what I have done. This is my own classification. I don't know if there is a, a formal uh, way of doing this. But I would say the classical period is from 1850s to 1950 approximately, which we covered in the last presentation in January. And today I'll be talking about the modern period from 1950 onwards. Next, please. But there are some different sub genres within the railway fiction genre. One can be storybook for children. Now, one very good example is the railway children. And I hope that my next presentation in this series will be on uh, railway fiction for children. That's a very interesting field. Then another possibility, another genre can be what is nowadays sometimes called faction. It is a mix of fact and fiction. So classic example of this is Howrah Junction by Mr. Sanjay Mukherjee, our uh, uh, head of our Calcutta chapter, a very uh, prominent member of our society. He's written this very interesting book, which is presented as fiction, but it is actually based on his own experiences of working as uh, the ADRM at Howrah. And finally, another one, which I don't know if there is enough material in this, and that is railway themed poetry. So there can be many more presentations in this series. Next, please. So let me talk about today's presentation. The focus is on the written word, specifically short stories and novels with railway themes published after 1950. Today, I'll be uh, touching upon seven different authors across the globe. And there was a contest for guessing their names. I don't know if, if any entries have come. Oh, we have 11 entries. Oh, that's very nice, sir. That's a, thank you for fact, all the... I'm also a bit surprised. I thought we won't get more than six, <laughs> seven, but we got 11. I see. So thank you to all the participants. It's good to see uh, so much interaction. And uh, my emphasis will be on lesser known works. If an author has written uh, multiple books or stories which qualify, for this, then I'll try to talk about the ones which are not so well known. And uh, uh, a clarification that, uh, the, or um, should I say a disclaimer, that this is entirely a personal choice. I am uh, employed by Indian Railways, but this is not, these uh, works are not endorsed by Railways. And, um, and it's, uh, nor, nor was there any committee to choose this. This is entirely my own personal choice. It is. You could call it arbitrary. And uh, these are only the books which I have read and uh, which are in English, originally in English or, or where translations are available. So maybe you have some favorites which you won't find here. Well, maybe I have not read those books or I have forgotten about them or maybe I didn't like them. So there could be multiple reasons for not seeing your own favorites here. But then this is something which... Uh, I'm sure uh, anyone else who has choices, who feels that they are left out, they are welcome to make their own presentation. This is not something which is, which is closed. This is a ever going, ever uh, 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 ongoing process. Mm -hmm. So others are also welcome to share their choices when the opportunity arises. So we'll move on. Uh, the first, uh, uh, next please. Okay. So this is the first author. Next. Next, please. Okay. So let me start with a quote uh, about uh, T.B. Macaulay, whom we all know started the concept of uh, English education in India. And this is a much quoted line from his Minute on Indian Education written in 1835. It says, we must at present do our best to form a class who may be interpreters between us and the millions whom we govern, a class of persons, Indian in blood and color, but English in taste, in opinions, in morals, and in intellect. Now, this created a class which went on to become uh, an elite class, the English-speaking class, or uh, a privileged class, which is sometimes called Macaulay's children. Now, uh, next please. The first author I'm talking about today is Kushwan Singh, who was very much a member of this class. He had a highly privileged background. Uh, for example, he spent most of his life in an apartment complex in the heart of old in, in the heart of New Delhi, which was built by his father and named after his grandfather. 
Now, that was the kind of privileged background which he came from. He was a lawyer, a diplomat, a journalist, an editor, an author, a very versatile writer. He wrote about history, nature, novel, short stories, columns, translations, even joke books. He was non-conformist and highly controversial. But today, let us see one of his stories. Uh, next, please. Uh, one of his favorite words was malice. So when he was the first picture on the left, when he was uh, editor of the Illustrated Weekly, he used to write a column called With Malice Towards One and All. Then he compiled his works into a book, a, a big book of malice. And then he wrote an autobiography called Tooth, Love and a Little Malice. So malice was a kind of trademark for him. Next, please. His best known book in the railway fiction genre is Train to Pakistan. It's a novel and a very serious novel. So uh, I, I preferred to talk about a story, a short story, which comes from the book on the right. Uh, it's a collection of short stories. I'll be talking of one particular story, which is uh, which I found very interesting. And it, it has a lot of other uh, issues linked to it. Next, please. The story, is called, the story is called Karma. It was published in 1989. It may have been published earlier, but in book form, it was published in 1989 in his collected works. Now, this is how the story goes. The, the photo which you see here is, uh, is just something which I found on the internet. And this is what I imagined would be a first class waiting room. Uh, the story, it does not have a date, but I guess it is set in the 1920s or 1930s. So Sir Mohanlal Barrister sips his drink in the first class waiting room before he boards a first class coach. Two drunken British soldiers enter his compartment and an altercation takes place. They don't like to see an Indian sitting in a first class compartment. So there's an altercation, an argument. And uh, next please. So uh, the, the, uh, the portions in italics are uh, quotes from the book, from the story. So they picked up Sir Mohan's suitcase and flung it on the platform. And the soldiers caught Sir Mohan by the arms and flung him out of the train. So not only they threw out his luggage, he threw out the passenger himself. And the train started moving. So he stared at the lighted windows of the train going past him in quickening tempo. The tail end of the train appeared with the red light and the guard standing in the open doorway with the flags in his hands. Next please. But he was not traveling alone. His wife, Lakshmi, or Lady Lal, was also traveling with him. and But she didn't go to the first class waiting room. She squatted on the platform and ate her own uh, aloo puri from a tiffin carrier which she was carrying. So, meanwhile, Lakshmi, Lady Lal, eats her home-cooked food and boards a zanana interclass compartment. Now, observe the difference between husband and wife. So, the story proceeds. Her mouth was bloated with betel saliva. She'd eaten a pan after her meal, which she had been storing up to spit as soon as the train cleared the station. As the train sped past the lighted part of the platform, uh, Lady Lal spat and sent a jet of red dribble flying across like a dart. Now, it's left to the imagination of the reader where this dart would land. Next, please. Now, what I find interesting about this is that this phenomenon of Macaulay's children and the rift it created, not only in society, but in within families, this was commented upon by a lot of others long before Kushban Singh. Gaganendra Tagore, for example, who was a nephew of uh, Shravinath Tagore and a very successful cartoonist in the early 20th century, he came up with this very interesting cartoon. He shows a gentleman, uh, uh, Bengali Bhadralok, standing on the platform. He is wearing a raincoat and carrying an umbrella. He's got a smart leather bag and a pet dog. And his wife is standing beside him. And she is getting wet in the rain. Her, her belongings are tied up in a bundle. And there's a baby who's also getting wet in the rain. But the husband doesn't want to share his umbrella. Now... And the title, the ironic title of this 
was respect towards wife in bengal this was a cartoon published in 1916 so i see an echo between what uh, kushwan singh writes and what uh, uh, tagore has drawn here and uh, interestingly both kushwan singh and tagore belong to this class of mikolas chitra they themselves were lampooning the uh, class of society to which they themselves belong next please so it's a short and simple story why i like the story it's a short and simple story train and platform are used as metaphors there is a dramatic example of strangers meeting on a train a stranger is actually uh, attacking you and throwing <laughs> throwing out your belongings and pushing you out of the train so that's that's a very dramatic example of strangers meeting and it shows this theme which i mentioned alienation of family members in a society which was already stratified indian society was already highly stratified when the british came and this class of mcolas children uh, created further uh, divisions within families next please so this brings us to the second author and this would be a bit of a surprise next please so first we have a quote from oscar wilde he says one should always have something sensational to read in a train so there could be different sensational things which one can carry to read in a train uh next piece okay so the second author of today is ray bradbury this would be a surprise because he is normally known as a science fiction author but he's also written a lot of fiction which is not uh science fiction no he was an avid reader but he never attended college that's that's an interesting thing uh, he only had a school level education his first story was published in 1939 when he was only 19 years old his first book in 1947 and he kept writing for seven decades he was a successful science fiction writer contemporary of isaac asimov and arthur c clarke but he also wrote other genres horror mystery and poetry and uh, in the 1980s he was uh, he also wrote the script for a number of tv serials based on his own works but he was not a very highly technical person he preferred train travel to flying he never learned to drive and he used typewriters so this was the kind of person we are talking about ray bradbury next please this uh, the one on the left fahrenheit 451 is his most famous work of science fiction the one on the right is uh, is uh, a collection of short stories from which today's story comes and the one in the middle is an interesting cover because you see how his first name has been included in his surname it's ray bradbury so r a y is uh, in a different color within his surname so i like this concept next please so the story which we are talking about is the town where nowhere got off, where, where no one got off written in 1958 it was published in a rather obscure magazine but it's a very powerful story and uh, i look forward to sharing it with you now there are two traveling salesmen and they are talking on a train between chicago and los angeles so i peered out of the window this is the narrator when is the next town coming up on what is the next town coming up on this line rampart uh, rampart junction i smiled sounds good i might get off there now this is a surprise because they are passing through a series of small towns they don't expect anyone to get off there they are going from one city to another city next please so the narrator gets off he actually gets off the narrator finds an old man sitting on a chair at the platform as i step down the old man's eyes flicked every door on the train and stopped surprised at me i thought he might wave but there was only a sudden coloring of his secret eyes a chemical change that was recognition now he's very surprised he's getting off at a station and this old man seems to know him next please the narrator explores the town and finds the old man following him everywhere it's a small town he walks around it and eventually he comes face to face with the old man and he says were you waiting for someone at the station yes he said you me the surprise must have shown in my face but why you never saw me before in your life 
Did I say that? I just said I was waiting. So the mystery grows. Next. He had turned and I had turned with him along the darkening river bank towards the trestle where the night trains ran over, going east, going west, but stopping a rare few times. So they are standing under a railway bridge with trestles. The old man confides that he was waiting for a stranger to come to the town so that he could push him into the river and kill him to overcome his own frustrations. Now that is why he was waiting at the station. Next please. Something screamed. I jerked my head. Now this is the most dramatic part of the story. Next please. And this is what happened. While they were talking, they were standing on the river bank underneath the bridge and suddenly a train came. And look at the description. Above, a fast flying night express razored along the unseen tracks. Flourished light on hill, forest, farm, town dwellings, field, ditch, meadow, ploughed earth and water. And then raving high, cut off away, shrieking, gone. So while the train was passing, obviously there would be so much noise that the conversation cannot continue. So once the train has passed, now the narrator gets a chance to reply to the old man. Next please. And this is what he says. To get off the train in a small town, I said, where nobody knows me, with this gun under my arm, and find someone and kill them and bury them and go back to the station and get on and go home and nobody the wiser. Now, it's a very interesting situation. Both of them realize that the other is going to murder him. Uh, intends to murder, not going to, but intends to murder him. So it's a stalemate. The narrator and the old man, they walk off in opposite directions. <coughs> they have an, an unspoken agreement and they decide to part. Next please. Now comes the interesting part, the more interesting part. The world turned under me. I clenched my fists. He's just survived an attempt on his life. I wanted to fall. I wanted to scream like the train. I love this line. I wanted to scream like the train. For suddenly I saw that all the things I had just said were not lies put forth to save my life. All the things I had just said to this man were true. Now this is where the reader starts thinking. What, what really happened? And the story ends after that. The narrator boards the next train towards Los Angeles. The story ends. So I found this a very powerful story. It's a very short story, about seven or eight pages. And uh, next please. So it's a short and dramatic story with powerful imagery. And all the events in this story are associated with trains. The narrator comes on a train. He reaches this uh, and he interacts with this old man on a train. And then he moves around. And then at a critical moment where his life is threatened, a train passes. And that gives him a chance to uh, prepare his reply. And eventually he, he leaves the town on a train. Interactions take place between strangers on the train and platform and underneath the train also, interestingly, uh, on underneath the railway bridge. So that is the crux of the story. Next piece. So we move on to the third one, the third author. Next piece. So again, we uh, visit Macaulay's children, the court of Macaulay, and, but with a twist. Next, please. Let us revisit Macaulay and uh, interchange English and Indian. So now we talk of someone, we imagine someone who is English in blood and color, but Indian in taste and opinions in morals and an intellect. There is a picture here, which is a hint, but then none of us would have seen him at this age. So we'll go to the next slide where we can easily recognize him. Next, please. This is Ruskin Bond, born in 1934. He is nearly 90 now. He is the opposite of a brown sahab. I don't know, probably the correct word is a white desi. He is born and brought up in India. Extremely prolific and popular writer. Uh, nobody knows how many books he has written. Uh, his characters inhabit their own little worlds and he's won a number of prizes. But more than the prizes is the recognition which he gets from his fans. And he's still active, although he's nearly 90. Next, please. 
Uh, if you allow me to in, uh, interject here, the person uh -huh. who would know how much he has written is Vikas Singh. Vikas Singh, yes, Vikas that's right. Singh has every single book, every single okay. manuscript <laughs> the Ruskin Bond has written. Right, right. So we'll we'll hear from Vikas. Is, is he here? I don't know. I don't think he's there. All, all right. Right, sir. We, we, we'll carry on. So Cambridge Book Depot in Masuri is uh, a bookstore which stocks his works. We went there about uh, uh, 10 years back. And this is the whole shelf. Uh, and in those days, Ruskin himself used to come there once in a week to uh, autograph his books. I don't know if he still does that because he's quite old now. Next, please. But we had a chance to meet him. This was in 2009. That's me and my family with Ruskin Bond. He is the only one of today's seven authors whom I have had a chance to meet and a very gracious person. So it was a pleasure to see him. Next, please. He has written a number of books with railway themes and he has also edited and compiled uh, anthologies on, of railway stories. So many of, them, many of these stories are very well known, but as I said, I'll be talking about lesser known works. So uh, next slide, please. I'll be talking about the story called Going Home. It's uh, published in uh, 2018, but uh, it's probably set uh, in the pre-independence era. It's, it's hard to say, but anyway. So this is how the story starts. The train came panting through the forest and into the flat brown plain. The engine whistled piercingly and a few cows moved off the track. In a swaying third class compartment, there on the farmer was going home, home to his rice fields, his buffalo and his wife. Now, there um, uh, it's a very sad occasion. He has just cremated his brother and uh, he went to Haridwar to scatter the ashes. And now he's going home. His village is near Dehradun and he's, he's taken a train and he's traveling on that. Next, please. Now, to distract himself, he starts playing with a child and his money is in a small bag and the child accidentally throws that bag out of the window. Now his money and his ticket are in that. So he wants to pull the chain, but fellow passengers say, no, no, this uh, you will have to pay a fine and you don't have money anyway. So the poor fellow gets frightened and he continues till the train stops at the next station, that is Harrawala. And he gets off there and he starts walking back. So he passes the place where the, where the bag would have dropped and eventually he reaches Rayawala, which is the previous station. And there he finds a notice on the station notice board saying that a bag has been found and it's available with the station master. And he goes there and the station master returns his bag. So he's very happy. Although he's, uh, he, he had to walk a long way in the heat, but he's very happy to get his bag. Uh, next please. So he left the station and made his way through a sleepy little bazaar to the nearest tea shop. He sat down at a table and asked for tea and a hookah. A young man sitting idly at the next table smiled at Dayaram and said, You are looking very happy, brother. Now, Dayaram loses half his money drinking and gambling with his new friend. His friend takes him to uh, uh, a place where they have liquor. And uh, when he comes out, he's already confused and half drunk. And the rest of his money is snatched by a pickpocket. So that is the Sad story of Dayaram. Next please. But he is confused. But still he goes to the station and boards the train. Luckily he still got his ticket. He, and he enters into a conversation with another farmer. Although a faint uneasiness still hovered at the back of his mind, Dayaram had almost forgotten the day's misfortunes. He and the other farmer chattered away as the train went panting across the white brown plain. Now again when you think of it, what did he lose? A few rupees? He, he endured uh, a lot of pain, a lot of, uh, he had to work very hard to get his money back and he blew it up because of his own uh, weaknesses. But then he hasn't really lost, it's not such a major loss. He still got his ticket, he's still going home. So it's a sort of storm in a teacup. Next please. But I was curious to see how long he had walked. So our friend Samit Rai Chaudhary, who's the authority on railway maps, he kindly gave me this map. And the distance which he is supposed to have walked is 31 kilometers. 
and the story mentions two and a half hours so that's average speed of more than 12 kilometers uh, per hour so i think that's a bit too much but then that's what the author says next please it's a deeply sentimental style the story uh, almost like prem chand the author has tremendous local knowledge the train route is authentic but uh, making him walk 31 kilometers is a bit excessive in my opinion it's an engrossing plot when you read it you want to reach out and tell, and tell there am rukjo rukjo stop don't do this it's not what you it's not uh, you're going in the wrong way but obviously you can't do that as a reader you just have to keep reading what's written and again meeting strangers he meets numerous strangers on and off the train some help him some harm him but he remains unfazed in the end so the story starts with him going home and the story ends with there i'm going home next please so we come to the next author the fourth author next a quote from paul thero the well known railway travelog writer anything is possible on a train a great meal a binge a visit from card players and intrigue a good night sleep and strangers monologues framed like russian short stories paul thero always emphasizes that there are many things that you can do on a train which you can't do on a plane or a car so these are some of those things next please <clears throat> today's author another surprise for people who know this name is david baldocci he qualified and initially worked as a lawyer but he had started writing in his childhood his mother gave him a diary as a birthday gift and he started writing in it he was the author of nearly 50 novels was uh, he is rather he is the author of nearly 50 novels some of them are series and some of them are stand alone mostly they are thrillers but there is one notable exception a very sweet book and it's called christmas train next please so these are four different covers of christmas train what uh, what surprised me is how inaccurate they are if you see the first two don't show a train at all the other two they showed trains but with steam locos and this book specifically describes diesel locos so it seems the people who make covers they don't bother to read the books now uh, there's a quote here this novel is dedicated to everyone who loves trains and holidays so that's a very uh, a sweet thought next please this is the inside cover of the book which i have and it says uh, there's a quote from the book why the train one might ask when there were perfectly good flights that would get the, get him there in a fraction of the time now this shows the attitude towards uh, rail travel in north america because the distances are so high it's uh, not just faster but also cheaper to travel by uh, to take a flight than to take a train next please so this is what the plot is like there's a 41 year old war correspondent tom langdon and he's in washington and he wants to meet his girlfriend his current girlfriend in um, uh, los angeles so he goes to the airport to take a flight but he gets into a brawl with the airport security and they uh, take action against him and they ban him from flying so he can't take any flight now and therefore he travels by train and he takes the capital limited from washington dc to chicago and then he takes the southwest chief from chicago to los angeles the total journey time is 60 hours or so next please <clears throat> now he meets several unforgettable characters such as a pushy lawyer a film crew remember is going to los angeles including his former girlfriend now that's interesting a young couple going to get married serving in former railway employees and so on now he starts getting attracted towards his former girlfriend and he is uh, inclined to propose to her but then something happens next please tom's current girlfriend boards the train this was totally unexpected but at one of the stations Uh, on the way the current girlfriend boards the train and you can imagine the kind of excitement which would have 
it's a story uh, worthy of hollywood or bollywood but then we are not looking we are not looking at the plot anymore we are looking at the railway aspects next please now here's a quote two interesting quotes from this book trains had a nostalgic magnetism that was undeniable even for the many americans who never even been on one so trains attract people who, even who have not traveled on them and the second one there were general electric p42s each weighing a staggering 268000 pounds cranking 16 cylinders and packing 4250 horsepower this data seems to be authentic next please there's more i i only taken part of it the g website says that in the early 1990s engineers at g transportation designed the p42 genesis diesel electric locomotive for amtrak and the streamlined low profile engine remains a workhorse of the system it can travel as fast as 110 miles per hour and pull 16 amtrak superliner coaches g manufactured and g manufactured more than 300 of them for amtrak metro north and vrl this is the standard locomotive for passenger trains it was when this book was written in 2003 and it still is i believe and uh, if you see the picture in the middle you you'll see some double decker coaches they also described in the book next please so this is a very classic quote uh, a character in the book he is an ex amtrak employee and uh, there's a conversation going on and this is what he says i am not saying that riding the train will change your life or that passenger rail will be a big money maker one day but no matter how fast we feel we have to go shouldn't there be room for a train where you can just sit back take a breath and be human for a while now this is the kind of feeling which i found uh, very touching and uh, Uh, i think this more than the plot the interesting plot i think this is what is the crux of the book next please i like this book because it is set it is set on two legendary amtrak trains the capital limited and the southwest chief and these are integral to the plot there are authentic details of diesel locomotives and coaches including automatic braking head end power and low idle feature imagine all these things are part of this they are described in the book and they are part of the plot it talks about the timeless appeal of train travel and it's a heartwarming story with engrossing subplots meeting old friends and making new ones so this is a very interesting book and i'll recommend it to everyone who has not read it so far next please okay so we come to the fifth author of the day i am running out of time next please this author is andrew martin and he is the one on the left in the picture and look what he says i spent a lot of time on trains my dad worked on br that is british rail and i had a privileged ticket entitling me to free first class journeys well we understand that but we call it privilege pass uh if it's free and if you pay one third it's called privilege ticket order but anyway the terminology may be a bit different but uh, we all know that children of of uh, railway employees turn out to be great rail fans they have a natural affinity towards railways so this is a quote from andrew martin and uh, next please it is precisely this author we are talking about andrew martin born in 1962 he qualified as a barrister and then he followed parallel careers as a novelist journalist documentary maker and musician and he writes fiction and non fiction about railways and he specializes in historic railway novels next please another quote from andrew martin i am sometimes introduced as a railway author which is annoying but entirely my own fault whilst i have written a dozen books that are not about railways i have written a dozen that are including nine historical thrillers set on edwardian railways and beyond 
uh, edwardian railways i suppose would be after 1901 when uh, edward the 7th came to the throne so uh, uh, next please he has created this character called jim stringer and jim stringer is the uh, uh, what should i say the hero or the protagonist of this series of uh, novels set in the early years of the 20th century and he is a railway detective so he comes to calcutta in 1923 accompanied by his wife and daughter to investigate corruption on eir that's east indian railway uh, now we have a separate department the vigilance department to investigate corruption but apparently uh, in those days the railway police looked into corruption also now uh, a fellow passenger is murdered when jim and his colleague are traveling to jamalpur they are going from howrah to jamalpur and a passenger gets murdered and several passengers of eir have died after being bitten by venomous snakes in first class coaches so the plot is that uh, someone goes uh, into a first class coach and once the train starts moving suddenly a large snake crawls out from under the berth and uh, uh, kills the passenger and so this has happened several times so these are this is the kind of situation which uh, which this book describes next please a quote about calcutta which i found interesting not very complimentary but very but very interesting and very very believable i walked on i turned from the din and chaos of the lhousi square into the din and chaos of chorangi street the sun was going down rapidly but i was sweating freely every electric tram advertised life boy soap and you could see why the whole city was in need of the stuff so <laughs> people are sweating so much that they need they need uh, life boy soap to wash it off next please next please ha ah. so here is uh, another quote from jamalpur workshop uh anything metal at jamalpur was too hot to touch and all day long the air was overcharged with black smoke from the foundry chimney we saw railway workshops iron foundry pattern shop brass fitting shop turning shop erecting shop carpentry shop paint shop you said that they made almost any part of the train on site except wheels which seemed perverse of them wheels was the only thing which were imported in those days everything was uh, was made in house in jamalpur workshop next please a third quote the crest of the east indian railway locomotive palm tree and elephant enclosed by a circular track like a child's attempt to sum up india in a single drawing very, very interesting very witty quote but unfortunately it's not true next please instead of quote number 3 i should call it howler number 1 the crest of east indian railway if you see it's the one on the left it does not have a locomotive it does not have a palm tree it has an elephant but there is no circular track <laughs> there are if you see south indian railway it has an elephant and palm tree but no locomotive if you see bb and cir it has a locomotive and uh, palm tree but no elephant and none of them have got the circular track so this was the author's imagination next please now why i like this book is the irresistible title it is set in 1923 exactly one century ago i thought it's a good omen and it has much historical detail about calcutta but uh there are many inaccuracies about railway matters i have only pointed out one it's a highly imaginative book and there there's a theme of fatal encounters with strangers on the trains now this the strangers are in human form because there was a murder and they could be in form of a snake sometimes if you don't like someone you say that this this is a, a snake in human form and here there were snakes in snake form which were killing passengers so that's a very imaginative kind of uh, of uh, plot 
But anyway, next. Now, the reason why I don't like this book, it's not that I always like whatever I'm presenting. This is a complex plot with many sub themes. It talks about East Indian Railway, it talks about corruption and crime, snakes and snake charmers, social life in Calcutta and Darjeeling, freedom struggle, problem faced by Anglo Indians, professional rivalry between Jim and his colleague, Jim's family problems. Now, all this is rolled into the story and it becomes very complex. Next, please. And there is very little about Jamalpur, despite the catchy title. And the major flaw in the plot. EIR would have undertaken a special drive to ensure that there were no snakes in first class carriages. Now, even today, if you find that something is repeatedly going wrong, you take steps to make sure that that thing doesn't happen again. Now, something so dramatic as a large snake crawling out of the berth and uh, killing a passenger, this would, for months after that, every coach would be checked thoroughly. And it will not happen again and again, as it happens in the story. So I think this is a major flaw, a major flaw in the story. But then that's how it is. So this brings us to the next book. Next, please. Number six. Next. Okay. A quote from Shakespeare. What's in a name? That which we call a rose by any other name would smell as sweet. Next. And this author... Jhumpa Lahiri, this lady defies Shakespeare in her book called The Namesake. She was born in London to Bengali parents. She's highly educated. She has three master's degrees and a PhD to her credit. She's a highly successful novelist and short story writer. She's a global citizen. She's married to a journalist of Guatemalan Greek origin. And she lives in Rome and writes in Italian. So it doesn't get more global than that. Next, please. Today, I'll be talking about her debut novel, The Namesake, written in 2003, best-selling novel, set in India and USA. It won the Pulitzer Prize and it was made into an acclaimed movie. Now, why I'm showing multiple covers is that, once again, none of these covers have anything to do with the plot. And ironically, if you see the fifth book, the one on the right, is Jhumpa Lahiri's own book in which she talks about the covers of books. The whole book is about covers of books. And uh, her own debut novel has got such irrelevant covers. Next, please. So the plot, the interesting part about the railway, uh, the role of railway in this novel. Ashok Ganguly, is, he's a, he's a student. He's an engineering college student. He's reading his favorite book by Nikolai Gogol while traveling by train to Jamshedpur. He's going from Howla to Jamshedpur to meet his grandparents. Now, a serious accident takes place. There are uh, graphic descriptions of the accident. Uh, he survives a serious accident and he gets rescued while he's still clutching a page from, the, from his beloved book. Now, later Ashok goes to Boston University for his PhD and he marries Ashima and a son is born. And Ashok names him Gogol as a tribute to his favorite author. Now, this incident was so important in his life and he associated his survival with this book. So, Gogol in any case was his favorite author. Now, he became a sort of uh, mascot or talisman for him for his uh, survival. Next, please. So here is a quote about the railway part. The steam engine puffed reassuringly, powerfully. Deep in his chest, he felt the rough jostle of the wheels. Sparks from the smokestack passed by his window. A fine layer of sticky soup dotted one side of his face, his eyelid, his arm, his neck. Now this is travel uh, in a coach with open windows with uh, steam logo ahead. Very, very nice description. Next, please. And about the namesake part, pet names are a persistent reminder of childhood, the reminder that life is not always so serious, so formal, so complicated. They are a reminder too that one is not all things to all people. Now, this is a 300-page novel, so there's a lot of things one can uh, read and interpret. But I found this quote very interesting and very 
uh, very much true in our in our daily lives and uh, the last three lines are how you would put jhumpa lahiri's formal name but if you see this on the cover of a book you wouldn't buy it you buy it only because you see jhumpa lahiri so in her own way her own name has helped her career next please why i like this book is ashok strange journey shapes the journey of his life this is very interesting as i said this is a turning point in his life so even if he years pass he goes to another country he becomes a father but he is still carrying the memories of his train journey the theme of meeting strangers is is extended to being saved by strangers and uh, the author as i said defies shakespeare names carry deep personal familial cultural religious and historical associations and it emph- emphasizes the importance of branding now if you think that branding is not important in the field of railways just think of rajdhani or shatabdi or think of vande bharat and think of the uh, images which come to your mind so that is the importance of branding in today's world next please so we come to the last author i am sorry i am running out of time i'll take another 5 uh, to 10 minutes next please railway writing from now on is going to be historical andrew martin whom we have met earlier he himself writes uh, historical railway novels we have just seen one and he believes i heard an online talk from him recent uh, made, made by him recently and he believes that railway writing in future people will write about railways of the past because today's railways are not interesting enough next so we have met a lady who defied shakespeare now we meet another lady who defied andrew martin this is paula hawkins she was born in 1972 in rhodesia what is called zimbabwe now she studied in oxford university she worked as a journalist and author and she wrote the best selling novel the girl on the train published in 2015 next please now this book uh became a best seller it topped the uk and the us best seller list it was the most borrowed book from libraries and its movie version starring emily blunt was set in new york in 2015 and another movie starring parineeti chopra even bollywood jumped into this and uh, this was set in london in 2021 i'd like to see this one but i haven't got around to it yet next please now here is a quote from the book this the narrator is a daily commuter from the suburbs to london so this is what she says someone in the seat behind me gives a sigh of hopeless irritation the 804 slow train from ashbury to euston can test the patience of the most seasoned commuter the journey is supposed to take 54 minutes but it rarely does this section of the track is ancient decrepit beset with signaling problems and never ending engineering works so this is about you see the the description the environment in which uh, this uh, narrator travels next now this is what she sees from the train now it's not about the train it's what you see from the window i know that on warm summer evenings the occupant of this house now the train stops at a signal and there's that house beside the track jason and jess sometimes climb out of the large sash window to sit on the makeshift terrace on top of the kitchen extension roof they are a perfect golden couple they are a young couple she keeps observing them whenever the train stops while we are stuck at the red signal i look for them Jess is often out there in the mornings especially in summer drinking her coffee now remember she doesn't know them jason and jess are not their real names these are her imagination she gives them those names next now rachel is the narrator and she is certain that jess and jason are happily married and she speculates about their professions because she keeps seeing them she imagines that she imagines that 
he might be a doctor and she imagines that she might be an artist but then it's all imagination she has never uh, she does not know them in real life and then one day from the window of her train rachel observes jess kissing a stranger in in her garden now this garden is located between the house and the railway track so uh jess thinks that she is not being observed but uh, the narrator rachel is seeing her from the train and she is kissing a stranger the next day jess whose real name is megan disappears so rachel goes to the police to say that this is what she had seen but then the story starts unraveling next please till then we don't know about the narrator's background we only know her as someone who is a daily commuter then we come to know that rachel is lonely and unemployed she struggles with alcohol addiction and she suffers from depression and blackouts next we come to know that she used to live in that neighborhood with her former husband tom she is divorced now and tom still lives there with his wife and child his new wife and child and with this background rachel's narration is considered is considered unreliable so this is this is the uh, the way this 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 book is written that the police don't believe her because of her background and finally the reader also starts having doubts about what she is saying because she is not a reliable narrator next please this is a shot from the movie and uh, you see emily blunt playing the title role look at the look of confusion on her face look at the pain in her eyes and uh, if she looks familiar that's because she played mrs oppenheimer in oppenheimer that's that's why she might look familiar to you but uh, i think this one photograph captures very well what the uh, author was trying to say next please so this book is published and set in the 21st century unlike all the others which were set in the latter half of the 20th century it uses the unreliable narrator technique pioneered by victorian authors like agatha christie and um, it highlights first world problems the kind of loneliness alcoholism uh, unemployment this is more of a first world phenomenon and uh, it defies martin as we said as we saw he says that his uh, train novels would be set in the past but here it features a contemporary commuter train and the most interesting part is in today's world of of digitization and uh, zoom meetings this is the ultimate variation of strangers meeting on the train now here it's a virtual meeting the strangers do not enter the train she does not actually meet them she only sees them from the train and she imagines the rest so this is this is i think it's the ultimate variation of uh, strangers meeting where the strangers don't physically meet at all next please so this brings us to the conclusion next please i am sorry i have overshot my time a bit so these are the seven authors of the day Pushpan Singh, Ray Bradbury, uh, Ruskin Bond, David Beldocci, Andrew Martin, Jhumpa Lahiri, and Paula Hawkins. <laughs> I'm not sure how many of these have been guessed, but we'll find out soon. All these authors were born between 1914 and 1972. Their works, which we covered today, have been published between 1958 and 2015. They are from multiple nationalities: Indian, British, and American. i will not try to say who's who i leave it to you and out of the seven stories we have discussed four are set in india two in the us and one in the uk and interestingly all feature steam traction with just two exceptions one is uh, christmas train which is about diesel engines and diesel locos and uh, the last one the girl on the train has a commuter train an emu the rest interestingly five out of the seven still feature steam locomotives although they were all uh, written after 1950 so this comes 
this brings us to the end of the presentation. Next slide, please. And here's a parting quote, which I found particularly interesting. It's the last line of this book. And I have to get up early tomorrow morning to catch the train. I found this particularly apt because my I have been on leave for a long time and my vacation is ending today. And tomorrow morning, I have to get up early and catch the train from uh, Howrah to Chitranjan. So I found this quotation particularly apt to end this presentation. Next, please. Thank you very much for your patient hearing. And my apologies for overshooting the time. And I hope to see you again in my next presentation. Well, thank you very much, Othalia. Um, at least I did not get my eyes off the screen and all my ears off what you were saying for even thank a single something. minute. Hmm? I mean, a very engrossing and well-researched talk. Uh, I wonder how many of us can analyze the books we read the way you do. Thank you, very much. Thank, you. thank you Thank you for your kindness. You know, it is an interesting approach to reading books that you analyze what the book is, why you like it, why you don't like it. I, I think, think one has to be an author himself. I'm That's saying right. I think one has to be an author himself to analyze the way Atulia does. Thank you. Thank you. I know. I know. I know. Coming to the contest that we had, this is also Sorry. the first time in this series of 35 talks that we've had a contest. Interestingly, we had 11 entries. And I must say the result is not very good. But in fact, it is even better than what I thought it would be. I see. Uh, the person who's done the best is Mr. D.K. Guha. I see. I hope you are online, Mr. Guha. He doesn't seem to be there. But he's got three out of seven, right? He's got three out of seven, all right. Yeah, he's got uh, Paula Hawkins, Ruskin Bond, and Kushwan Singh, right? That's wonderful. And there are two persons who have got two, right? I see. One is Sagar Tipnis. He's got Andrew Martin and Ruskin Bond, right? I see. And one is Asta Sne Patak, who got Ruskin Bond and Andrew Martin, right? Okay, so so they'll share the. Th so, so uh, congratulations to our uh, three winners. Uh, I'll be writing to you separately and uh, telling you what your gift is or what your prize is. Uh, I think, I, I think... Uh, two of these prizes have been sponsored by Atulia Sena himself. So, please announce Can them on the, on the group, sir, and uh, I, I'll send the books to the to the prize winners. Yeah, no, I will... Uh, uh, we will do the... I mean, I'll be in touch with you for that. Right, sir. Uh, the two books are... are uh, Sponsored by you, and one book will be sponsored by the Rail Enthusiast Society. Oh, I'll make it free. That's not a problem. I'll make it free. No, 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 no problem. There are two. Anyway, that's I think even, even two is more than what you should be doing. Right, sir. So anyway, thank you very much. It was a wonderful and grossing talk. And <laughs> we'll surely have you for the sixth time. Uh, Date and time, we, we'll, we'll decide. We have thank you very much to all, to all the listeners who kept uh, hearing very patiently. But I'm not surprised because the, the talk was that engrossing. We have over 42 so covenants. Everyone. Most of uh -huh. them uh, yeah, come uh, complimentary. I'll share the uh, text file with you. Yes, please. Uh, which uh, lists all the comments. Yeah. Yes, sir. Okay, thank you very much. I think yeah. you can... Uh, uh, may I stop the recording? Yeah, that's right. Right, okay. Can I close the meeting? Okay, thanks everybody. Just for the record, we've had more than, we, at one stage, we, were, we had more than 40 people online. Yeah. Okay, that's, that's, that's okay. very nice. Yes, sir. Which is very high. Normally, we are in the 30s. Yeah. So, thank you very much, sir. And thank you very much okay. to all the audience for coming and uh, for your patient hearing. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you, sir. Uh, okay. So I'm stopping the meeting. Thank you so much. Take That's care. Right. Bye.